I mean, if you look around your world, I mean, it's everywhere. You don't notice it because you don't pay attention to it, right? But uh, you pay attention to it only when it breaks. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm a glass blower in Minneapolis, and I've been blowing glass since I was 14. I was addicted to it the moment I saw it, and I've been doing it ever since. How did glass blowing develop? They'd been doing ceramics for a long time, and they were always trying to get that ceramic as dense and as hard and as fired as possible so it wouldn't break when people used it. So they were always trying to get the temperature hotter and hotter and hotter. And the wood ash actually is a flux, and so they'd be putting more and more wood in there to get it hotter, there'd be more wood ash, the wood ash would collect on the pots and it would actually melt the surface of the pots. And you can see this today when modern potters do what's called salt firing, they throw salt in there and it, and it like melts the surface of the clay to the point where it's like a glaze. And so we think that it kind of started that way, like somebody just went overboard and like started melting this stuff and realized, wow, this stuff is fluid, maybe I can do something here. The kind of glass blowing that I do it requires a little more equipment. We have a furnace that holds 300 pounds of molten glass and you go in with a four foot long pipe and you actually gather it out as if you're gathering uh, like honey on the end of a spoon. At which point you can blow down the tube and that, that gob or gather will blow into a bubble. The choreography of glass blowing is one of the really fun aspects of it. There is a sort of protocol that you follow, and every glass blower knows that protocol uh, of how you deliver a bit or how you, you know, go do things. But it is a choreography because when you're working together, if you don't have your timing right, it can really mess things up. You know, biggest success, busy, biggest failure, off the top of my head, I mean, I'm standing in it. I started Foci Glass, Minnesota Center for Glass Arts. It started as my, my private studio. It was Foci Glass, it was what I called it. It was me and my brother. We had a private business, and I, I had people coming to me saying, hey, can I use your studio when you're not using it? And I never said no, I kept saying yes. And it grew into this nonprofit teaching institution, basically. The word Foci is the plural of focus. When I started the nonprofit, I thought to myself, well, that's, that's a great name for a community because it's all these people coming together to the same point and doing sort of the same thing at that point and then going off and doing their own things. It takes, I'd say, an average person about four to five years of doing it regularly, at least once a week for a, you know three, four hours to get, quote, good at, at it. So it's like an infinite range of ability that you can get good at. Gosh, being a maker, you know, I, I've been making stuff since I was very little. Out in the backyard, you know, like, you know, digging holes and using sticks and playing with mud and, and always be in, being interested in materials. I'd see a new material and I'd want to know how, how it cut, you know? How does it work, you know? And so I think it really started with that kind of, like materials, like how can you use materials and make something that's going to be useful? And then art kind of comes later. And then that led me to, to sort of go, well, I know how machines can make it, but how did they make it a thousand years ago? You know, that was always very fascinating to me. 